So, so I hope that that means that you will feel comfortable uh, jumping in and asking questions. We have some questions that we're going to be talking about, but uh, it, we're here in our new facility. I want to recognize Mr. John Stewart, who is. Hello, and welcome everybody. <laughs> Well, I would like to consider myself an honorary member. Uh, you, you, the, the, absolutely. For many years, John has supported our efforts and he continues to do so. We're very thankful, John. Love and some of our faculty, uh, Ibru Ozer, Gianna yeah. Gianna in the back. Welcome to hey. Alumni turned faculty, Casey Parrales. Bryce Donner, uh, who joined us this year. Um, so thank you, and thank you, Charlotte, for uh, you know helping us out with with, uh, with everything. So um, and Colette, and Colette, and Colette, of course, Colette, special events manager, special Colette, right, right here. There you are, Colette. Colette, thank you again uh, for you know helping us out, and hopefully you know this is a setup that we'll continue to do many times in the semester. Stay tuned for the announcements. Um, we have seven such sessions planned. The next one is going to be this coming Thursday. And we have uh, many more, so I hope that you will join us. And, uh, and again, thank you for making this possible, Colette, John, everybody. All right, so uh, I thought, you know, who better than uh, Elizabeth, uh, Ellie. Uh, Ellie graduated, I think, a little over 10 years ago. That's right. Um, Thanks for the reminder. I think, yes. <laughs> I know. Uh, and and uh, I think, you know, I remember Ellie in many classes as being one of these students that are, is always challenging you to stay ahead because no matter what you put in front of her, she always outdid and outpaced you. So it's, it's, it's very special uh, to have you. And um, so Ellie was born and raised in Colombia. That's right, Bogota, Colombia. Bogota, Colombia. Uh, and her ancestry is Dutch. My, my father is Hence Dutch. Hence the name Van de Yeah, you almost got it. Van de Levine, but Van de Levine. Okay. You're getting there. Ten more years, you'll get there. But uh, Ellie grew up in, in, uh, in Colombia, and uh, she she came into our program, uh, and uh, I think a couple of things stand out. Uh, not only, I think, your dedication over the years, your passion for what you do, but also an incredible sense of responsibility, which I think is reflected in some of the work and the foundation, the nonprofit foundation, the Wolak and Foundation, which we'll talk about a little bit. Um, so uh, she's she started as soon as she graduated. She got hired probably before she graduated, uh, and she is now uh, her own boss, uh, business owner. And some of the beautiful work that we're, uh, you know, scrolling through uh, is hers and has her signature on it. So, mm -hmm. congratulations on all that. Thank you. Thank you so much. I appreciate yes. it. I appreciate being here. Thank you. So, so the format is um, to have a few questions, and then sure. again, as we get going, uh, if you have any doubt or want anything, want to know a little bit more, please jump in. Um, so let's begin, I think, before well, let's take any breath. I'm very nervous. <laughs> Why? You are family here. <laughs> I know, I know. It's, it's good to see new faces. I love to see, you know, people that, you know, have been around before, but it's, you know, I'm still a little nervous. You know, I care about these things, so. That's a good, that's a good sign. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So, um, but maybe we can start, uh, maybe take us back to before sure. you even thought about landscape architecture. We all know it's a field that we discover in kind of um, unusual ways. You know, everybody has a story. What is your story? How did you get to this? Well, I think I share this a story very similar to many of the students, which is, you know, I studied architecture, uh, applied to the School of Architecture, and I, it was suggested to me to try landscape architecture because of my portfolio. I actually didn't get into the architectural department devastated. I went to a park, cried, thought my life was over, I was, my family was going to disown me. It was, but I think a lot of us have the same story, right? That we're, you know, some of us have uh, an idea of what landscape architecture is and some of us just kind of get pushed into it. And, you know, till this day is the best thing that has ever happened to me career-wise. Uh, but, yeah, simply, I, you know, my portfolio was more of a landscape architecture, um, you know, flavor. 
and I was introduced, you know, I was asked to, to speak with you, and I was introduced to the faculty, and, you know, I decided to, to go for it because I've always liked the outdoors. Uh, my father is a, a retired um, uh, forest engineer from the United Nations, so I always had, you know, this outdoors uh, feeling inside me, so it kind of, it was, it, it was a perfect match. So from the beginning, from day one, it was challenging, I was very confused, I was like, I don't know any trees, I don't know what I'm supposed to be doing, but like everybody else, you know, with the help of, you know, the professors and, you know, getting to know people within the program that were on the same boat I was, it was, it was easy to just, you know, blend in and, you know, go grow, grow with them. And then, uh, well then, so Women in Landscape Architecture, yeah. this is a nonprofit that you started how long ago? Yeah, uh, we started in 2018, okay. so about three years ago. And what was the motivation? Why, why did you feel that you needed to do that and why a nonprofit? Sure. Um, I've always, ever since I started working, well, I come from a coaching background. I, I was coaching soccer for 15 years. Uh, you know, I'm very team oriented, I, I, I enjoy being a leader. And uh, as soon as I started my career working in, in different offices, I always had this idea to, to help people and, and help to train people. So if anybody came in new to the office, I would always volunteer to, to help them with, you know, getting used to it, going over our standards. So I started, you know, with that and I had that idea in me, but I just didn't know how to, I guess, bring it all together. And, and you know, sometimes it's very difficult to, you know, you have these ideas, but you never really implement them or you don't have a chance to. And I cannot tell you, you know, exactly how it happened, but one day in 2018, October, I know I've told this story and it doesn't make sense, but I hope that one day it does, because I don't really have the exact words. But I woke up, turned on the news, at that time, it was uh, the president of the United States, and there was this whole thing happening. Uh, you know, I'm not into politics. You know, I'm very stay very far away from that. Uh, but there, there was this um, uh, this moment where we had uh, Dr. Kevin on uh, coming out on CNN, and she was accusing somebody of doing something. Period. Right? And there was some mocking back to her. You know, she's a liar, and in all of this that that's happening that morning, this woman says, you know, I'm, I'm willing to risk it all because this is what I believe in, and this is um, what I feel is right. And I drove to work. I was supposed to start at 9. It was 11 o'clock, and I'm sitting in front of my computer, and I can't. And I'm like, this can't be the leadership that we need to follow. I can't believe really People make fun of women. We, you know, I just had all these thoughts, and everything just kind of rushed in. I can't remember the moment exactly, but I step outside. I, I send a message to my fiance, and I say, "We're going to do something. We're not politicians. We're not going to fix the world. I know we only do landscape architecture, but we're going to do something. So we're going to open a nonprofit for women in landscape architecture to give everybody a voice and do something and go for it." So I have to give credit to to that president <laughs> because that was actually the push. You know, if you have something in you, um, you just have to go for it. So that's honestly how it started. Yeah. It's very difficult because that was just the idea, and I was like, great, mm -hmm. open a nonprofit. But there's a lot of work mm -hmm. and effort that goes into it. Well, there. and one of the things I really appreciate is how, in the time that you have been doing it, I mean, actually, many people in this room. I think have been a part of that in some capacity. Sure. Yeah. Um, you're Maybe. extremely collaborative, and and that I think is a, is an example. I think of, of yeah. uh, leadership too. Is you know how do you make sure that you bring people with you and make these things happen? Yeah. Uh, I mean, one of the most important things is when you open anything is to have a strong team behind you. And and I would not we would not be here if it wasn't for Kelsey and Roberto, Andy and Natalie. Like they are. They're, they are the foundation, you know. Um, I could, I mean, I, I think that sometimes you can do things on your own, but they'll never be as great, you know. So having a strong team and people that supported you and, you know, that believe in the crazy ideas that you have and are willing to stay up with you and go with you after work and 
not really understand what we're doing, but still going for it and trying it, that that is really the reason why it's been the success. Even though it's not huge, uh, I, I, I feel that we've made it, we've come a long way. So they say it's, if you want to go, um, if you want to go um, fast, you go alone. Yeah. But if you want to go far, you go with others. Exactly. And that. I think you're really a great example of that. So thank you. It, it feels that way. Yeah, really. Uh, it's it's a wonderful team to work with. So then, when you finished at FIU, tell us a little bit. I mean, I think we all we graduate, we have these ideas of what this field is all about, and then we go to different firms that attract us for whatever reason, or we uh, jump in and work with nonprofits. There's so many avenues yeah. that lead us into this field and so many avenues that happen afterwards. So talk a little bit about that trajectory. Like what, you know, yeah. what was your thinking and what did you do? Well, um, I think I was a, a bit different. Uh, and now that I can go, go back and, and look at the things that, not that I would have changed anything, you know, the path that I took is the path that I took. But when I finished school, I was a little bit, I was really burned out. Um, I love you, but I was really burnt out. I loved you, I know. Um, and also, you know, I at that time I was going through, you know, a little bit of a personal situation. My my mom, my mother was diagnosed with cancer. Um, I don't think you know this, but I would leave your studio to go take care of her and then come back after her chemo, and I wouldn't really tell you guys because I didn't want to worry you. So that's something new. Um, so I was really burnt out, and, and I loved what I did, and, and I was proud of the work that I did, and I, as you know, I did everything. I, I just wanted to be the best student. I just didn't know how to be the best professional yet. Um, and I, was, I wasn't very confident, to be honest with you. Um, I, I knew what, I, what design was, and I felt strong about coming up with ideas, and doing analysis and coming up with meaningful projects, but I was really afraid to go out into the world. And I think my mistake back then is that I didn't, um, I was too, I wasn't, um, I was, I'm trying to find the right word, um, that is not confident, but I, I, you know, you would bring people to come to the school to talk and it's really great landscape architects and these amazing architects with really great projects and I was very intimidated, that's the word. Mm -hmm. So when I was going to school, I kind of was kind of in my little cocoon, you know, and I, and I liked what I did by myself, but I was always afraid to come out. Um, so when I finished school, I took a month off my father decided to, he was born in Indonesia, he's a, a World, War, World War II veteran. He was a, a prisoner of war in Indonesia. So as a gift, he said, you know, let's go to Indonesia and I'm going to show you everything about my life. So it was that or a car. Obviously, I took the trip, right? My sister chose the car, by the way. <laughs> but anyway, um, so I went and, and, you know, I just, it was really what I needed. On the way there, I remember I read one book and it was called The Happiness Project. Till this day, I have quotes from that book that I still use. But anyways, the point is that I left, learned everything about my father, learned tons of things about the world and, you know, kind of let my brain breathe for a little bit. Then I get back and I was at zero. I had, again, mistakes that I made. I had no contacts, I didn't have a mentor, all of my, connections were in here, in FIU, right? Because I was always so intimidated. I always saw all these architects and, you know, very successful people, so hard to reach. You know, I didn't think I was good enough. So I sat down for maybe like a month or two. Um, Gianno called me, and he offered me a job at his firm. I don't know why you did it till this day, but I, I'm assuming it's because you knew that I worked really hard and if, even if I didn't know anything, I would make sure to learn it and stay up and, you know, so it took, it was a big learning curve, you know. Um, I didn't go in there with the, you know, I'm the best, you know, I, I made it through, if I knew I could do it through, I, I knew I could stay up for hours, for sure, you know, I knew I could live with coffee, all that, but I, I was, you know, I took very, very tiny baby steps until I was finally, it wasn't until my third year 
in the profession that I started to feel like, okay, I can do this. I know what this is about. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. That's more and uh, so, I mean, I think you mentioned a couple of instances where there's these like moments of reckoning, almost the epiphanies, or, you know, um, the opportunity to travel with your father, mm -hmm. this moment, you know, when you witness something bad, you felt you had to do something about that. Um, and I think it, it's so easy to, I think, get caught up in just the day-to-day -day and just, you've got to do all this work. But it's helpful to know that these are defining moments, and we owe it, I think, to ourselves, and you're proof of that, that by stepping back and pausing and being self-critical, giving you a chance to kind of think, I think yeah. that's something that um, is a very important, extremely important. Um, and then you worked uh, not not just in one company, I think you, you worked in, in several firms, right? Mm -hmm. And then you decided to start your own thing. How long before you made that decision? What what propelled you to start your own business and, and do your own thing? Well, I was fired. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to be an open book because we're a family, okay? These are unplugged But sessions, these so. are the things that you need in life. And, you know, when it, it was hard, you know, but Behind there, there was the behind the firing. There was somebody pushing me, my mentor, my boss, saying, "You're ready. I'm gonna, I'm gonna fire you." Or, you know. So, you know, it was not something that I said. I always knew that I wanted to have to, to create the team that I was never that I was never able to create within another organization. So. For example, in the beginning firms that I worked at, I would say, okay, Mr. Boss, lady, we should go run the Mercedes-Benz uh, 5K with the team, you know, we need to be outside, we're landscape architects, we're sitting down eight hours a day, well, actually, 15 hours. Business. Yeah. Business. Or, you know, maybe we should do more things as a team, so we, we bring the team together, and they were always like, no, there's no time for that, we have deadlines, we have time for Um or being in a company where I would say, okay, you know, I think we need to kind of bring new programs and maybe we should try more of the 3D stuff or what can we do to, to go to a class and learn or uh, how can we bring our standards up or something like that. Something that I would ask, you know, or bring up to the table and it was always more of the culture of, you know, we're doing things for a certain amount of years the way that we are and we'd rather keep it this way because we're, the money's coming in. We're, we're good. And, and I totally understand that, right? But I, I wanted to, at some point, create the team, a, a team that would that I can do the things that I think are helpful for a, an amazing career, a, a professional career in landscape architecture. So a lot of the things that we do with Woolen and the things that I do in my company, even though it's very small, is, you know, we set time aside for learning. We set time aside for going on a walk. Family comes first, you know, all those things are super important to me, those values, that's that's what I'm going to grow in a company. Mm -hmm. So, and I think to go back a little bit, I mean, something that you point out in this field, like in most design fields, has historically this, this ethos of sacrifice and working really long hours. Um, and I don't think probably it's the healthiest reputation for a, you know, for, for a field or yeah. for a, a career. Um, but there's a choice that, that one has to make. And you spoke, you spoke about how when you were going through school, you felt intimidated. But like that shell almost that you, you built to kind of protect yourself um, was something that, I, I think that's something that we Speak a little bit more about that because on, a, on the one hand it might seem like the best strategy because you kind of hold it in, you're not vulnerable, you're, you're kind of protecting yourself sure. from judgment and um, and I think, I mean to this day we all, like, many of us suffer from imposter syndrome, right? We put ourselves yeah. in positions when sure. we feel like, wait a minute, is, yeah. this, really, uh, <laughs> is this really happening? So yeah. speak to that a little bit. Well, for me the way that I kind of broke through that shell, uh, or, that, that, or that barrier, that it, it's all about the mentality that you have. So one day I said, you know, if, if landscape architecture was easy, everybody would do it. 
right? And everybody would have a career, and, and, and I had to tell myself, <laughs> landscape architecture is not easy. I just have to be better. Mm -hmm. and, and that changed my entire career. And, you know, I don't need to get better in a week, I don't need to get better in a month or a year. I just gave myself permission to get better at things, little by little, and not put this pressure on me, um, which I, you know, recently I, for example, I don't put the pressure of social media on me right now. There's so many people out there doing amazing things and amazing projects, and you know, if I want to know something about the outside world or what that's happening in Australia, which is amazing projects, or what's happening in Southeast Asia or in Europe, I'll go look for it. I look for that information and I'll read a, a, an actual magazine, but I stay away from social media because that puts a lot of pressure on me. Why am I not having this many points? Why am I not being as good as this architect? Why don't I have these many awards? Why don't I come out on TV? Like, I can't live like that. So, anyways, the point is that I, I just, you just, you can get better. You just have to give yourself permission to get there. And it's not gonna happen overnight, mm -hmm. you know. And confidence grows as you keep practicing your craft and you keep moving forward. And so that's how I personally broke through it. You know, it's not easy. No, not it. you know. Yeah. You ask any of your family members or anybody that doesn't know landscape architecture, or you show them a project, or you show them an idea. They're like, "How did you come up with that?" Mm -hmm. You know, it's not easy. Mm -hmm. But you, you know, with practice, you can always get better. How um, how important has it been, and maybe you can give some examples of things that are not, I guess, considered landscape architecture, for you to do things that are outside of the craft, outside of this thing that you have committed your life to. How, how do you use that? What do you do? What kinds of things do you do outside of this world? Um. Well, to be able to do that, I had to train myself to be disciplined and to tell myself if something is important to you, like when you're dating somebody, right, and you want to go on a date, but you have a deadline, and if you care about that person and you want to go on a date, you're going to make sure you finish your deadline and you go. So, but, you know, that's not motivation, that's not like, I'm so motivated, to, you know, motivation, you're going to have some time. Discipline you can have always and you can always get better. So I discipline myself. So a good example of that is when I was working in my last firm I, I read a book Because I was after COVID I was like, you know, we had a situation where uh, I, I was in the hospital and All things sort of come up and, and you rethink life and stuff. But anyway, so I, I read this book and it's called like the four-hour week or something like that And I was like, you know I need to make sure that I do all my work at my job and I have enough hours to work on the nonprofit because it's important to me. So I discipline myself enough that after a couple of months, I would work four, week, four days a week and then Fridays, I would work for Friday, Saturday, and Sundays, I would work for, for, for the foundation. So um, for me, that, that's how I make it happen. Uh, and, and Sometimes I need a break from landscape architecture. I mean, I cannot talk to you about plants and concepts all day long. I really need a break. Um, so now what I try to do is be done with all my work by Thursday. It's a lot of work, and if I have to push hard, I push hard. But on Thursdays, uh, you know, I want to go play golf. Why? Because I think I hear that rich people play golf, so I'm, te I'm teaching myself how to play golf. Because I want for a client to call me one day and say, you know what, you work so hard. Let me fly you to Arizona somewhere and let's go play golf. And I want to say, yes, of course I can do it. You know, or if Natalie needs help in, in her business, she has a little juice bar. Um, maybe a month ago, I said I needed a, I have all these ideas and I needed to stop doing concepts for landscape architecture. And I said, I'm going to create a menu, uh, uh, an item on your menu. And she was like, what do you mean? And I was like, yeah, you know, I just have this idea that if we mix your Brazilian background with my Colombian Dutch background, we can make something great. And it's up on her menu today, you know? And, you know, it's a little distracting things that, that help you, you know, and it's like the way that I reward my body, you know, to do a lot of hard work 
and, and you know, coming up with a menu piece is also hard work because then I'm there doing the Photoshop, the concept, I'm like, what did I do? But it's fun and it's relaxing. Uh, but it's, it's, it's a reminder that if I discipline myself to get things, to do the things that sometimes I hate to do, I have to do it to, to, to make money, but then I reward myself with the, with the good stuff, you know, and that's family, friends, and, you know, love. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, the Woland is now, I guess it's fourth year, right? Yeah. 2018. Mm -hmm. um, and how do you see it evolving? And how do you see this relationship between that and this wonderful work that, you know, you're doing? How, how do they complement each other? Um, when is the right time to start a nonprofit? I think at some point all of us have thought, yeah. oh, you know, I have this great idea. Maybe I should do a nonprofit. Yeah. So, yeah, you know, uh, any time is a good idea to do something good. Something that you're willing to give the time to. Um, and, you know, the, the goal of our foundation is to bridge that gap between education and the workforce. Why? Because everybody that we talk to, there's, there's this learning curve and there's this there's gap between you know what you go to school to do and when you end up doing in the real world in landscape architecture. I mean there's a lot of things to carry with you, uh, but there's still a lot that we need to help bridge, right? And and until I feel that that we've connected that, then we're gonna see what it's gonna flourish into. But there's so much work to do and so many projects to to help us make that tie. Mm -hmm that, you know, it, it's going to evolve, you know, it's so free and so open-minded that it's going to evolve into whatever it needs to be. Mm -hmm. You know, my, my dream is that it, it, it goes down to the next generation and they take it and they do what needs to be done at that time, whatever is needed to happen, right? Mm -hmm. Just to keep going with landscape architecture because it's always changing, there's always priorities, there's, you know, the world has so many things that need help with mm -hmm. that this foundation is, is it's a free platform to, to do that. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's the goal. So uh, maybe let's uh, change the, the um, topic a little bit into speaking about the process. You know, your particular, you know, you've been at it 10 years. Being in yeah. school is one thing. Working in a firm is one thing. Doing your own thing is another. Um, but all of that, I think, it's clear from the work that you know, you're sharing with us that there's clearly, I mean, a process. There's, there's an aesthetic. There's something that makes you do things a certain way. Can you talk about that? How do you go about the design process, and maybe how has it changed? You know, in, in the time that you've been. Yeah, you know, going, in. going into the real world, it's it's a little bit intimidating because, well, first of all, one of the things that we 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 have lectures about, and we come back to to the next generation to talk about, is that there's there's a process to get to to a certain level right and it's going to be very rare that you're going to be hired by any company and, and they're going to say to you all right thank you for coming in see your office please you're the new lead designer of the firm you know you have to go through a process and i think that was the, the shock for me right you know i came we came from a very uh, you know concept that design oriented background and I thought that that's what it was all about, right? So when I got to the real world, and I'm like, where am I going to do my concept drawings? You know, and, and you know, one of the things that I missed to do when I was going to school is really understand what that process is, right? And, and where, where do you start, and how you move up? You know, it's almost I don't want to call it a, a ladder, but it's you know, you go through stages. You know, you start with what a company needs you for the most, which everybody here knows it's going to be production, right? They're going to need you for production. Right, uh, but you don't always need to be there. You know, you you get to a, a level and then you move up to the next level, and maybe you take a little bit more responsibility, and maybe you start going to client meetings and you start to help with you know other things that are maybe more graphic, and then you do more. You know, you you keep going up and up and up. So a great example of that for me, and I started to just get really bored because. I, every day was predictable, right? You show up, you do production work, you sit there for nine hours, sometimes 15 hours, and you know you have to do all this technical AutoCAD work, and then you print it, you give it to your principal, they draw on it, they tell you to ch change this, you know, red lines, right? 
and I, you know, I just started to get very discouraged. And it wasn't until my, my, my mentor, my boss at that time, I said, you know, I'm just getting really tired. Like, I, I can do so much more. I am good, you know, I can go to the sites and I, and I can design and I can do all that. And, and then she just said to me, the day that I give you a drawing and you give it a, a task and you give it back to me and it doesn't have any of my red lines, then you're ready to go to the next step. And then it clicked. So within a month, my drawings were perfect. You know, you know, I, 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 my, my, my mind changed, changed, it shifted, right? I'm not, I'm not a drafter, I'm a designer. So when I'm drawing and I'm doing everything I need to do on the computer, I'm thinking, how are they gonna build this? Is it, do they understand what I'm trying to say? Are my line weights correct? So, you know, you saw the difference in my drawings. I wasn't there to just do a nine to five. I was there to grow. So until you have that mentality, you're gonna stay, you know, at a certain level. Now, don't get me wrong, there's people that, and I have nothing against that, there's people that love to do drafting. And there are pieces of art, and I, I'm, I'm not good at all. I'm not good at production. Sometimes when I meet somebody that is, and they really uh, are good at their craft, that, that's also valuable you know, to a company. Some people don't want to take their responsibility. Some people want to be leaders. Some people just want to you know, do a certain uh, activity at the, in their office. And that's how teams work, right? Some people are drafting. Some people are graphics people. Some people are the presenters. Some people are the lead designers. And all that combined is what makes a great team. Right? But, but for me, I knew that I, I wasn't going to be that. I needed to be you know, on another level because I wanted to be a designer. I wanted to work with people. Mm -hmm. So maybe think, I want you to think about maybe some of the projects that have been the most satisfying, the most rewarding mm. in your mind. What distinguishes a great project that you feel really messed up to this day? remember very well. I mean, there's the other ones as well, but... Yeah, no, definitely. There's always projects, but for me, the satisfaction comes when when it's over, when it's built and you have uh, your clients or whoever you're working for coming up to you and telling you, thank you so much. This is beyond what I could have expected. Um, I don't have a... You know, every project comes with its own challenges and it's, you know... It, the ups and downs, you know, every project that I've done, I, I've just done it with everything that I have in me. You know, I don't stop until I give it my all. So there hasn't been a project where I say, you know, um, this this gave me a better feeling than another one. Or there's always lessons learned. There, there are projects that I look at um, and I'm like, okay, I should have done a little something different. Uh, you know, learn learn from those mistakes and, and make it better next time. Uh, you know, just last week we just finished a project in Fort Lauderdale and, and you know, really big project. I mean, in, in terms of, 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 uh, of price, it was my my most expensive um, property. The house was valued at I think 15 some 15.9 million dollars, and the landscape was you know very big number and you know I was going there every day and making sure that everything was going right and it didn't feel right and it didn't feel right until the wife comes up from the balcony and she says you know this is exactly what I wanted my job is done pay me you know <laughs> so that for me it's the satisfaction I I'm telling you there's times where I walk to projects that I've done before especially if it's you know park or something public uh, and I have to tell you, sometimes I'm like, what was I thinking? That, that does not work, you know, and paper looks great, and my rendering can look awesome, but that plant did not stay three feet. It grew six feet, and now I can't see the water, you know. There's always lessons to learn, so every project is like a little baby. A project so, that I hate, <laughs> but I, you know, you, you, you love your kids, you know? Yeah, you learn from all yeah, you know. Um, so I have one more question and I'll turn it over to the students, but, and maybe this is a way to kind of prime the, the thinking about their, uh, you know, where they are. Um, and granted, yes, it's been 10 years, but yeah. I'm sure you can remember uh, things that you would have done the same and things that you would have done differently as a student, you know, pitfalls, 
success stories. Yeah. What can you can you start that conversation? Yeah. Oh. I can go back. I mean, again, I don't regret anything of my journey because it's made me who I am today. And, and uh, you know, I one of the things I wish I would have done earlier was look for a mentor. I, uh, like I said, I was very intimidated. I, I don't know why. You know, I'm an outgoing person, but I was always so afraid to go up to somebody because they're just, I had everybody on a pedestal, you know. Um, so looking, having a mentor, and I, there's so many people in the workforce that are willing to mentor people because we want to share this information you know we don't want anybody to go through what we went through why why we waste the time you know it's time and money and mental health and all that so mentoring was would, would be a big thing that i wish i would have looked for earlier and it doesn't always have to be a professional or like in landscape architecture it could be a professor or it could be some anybody you know that can can you know show you the ropes about the real world and things like that and the other thing is, um, you know, my mental health and, and really taking care of that. And the reason why I think I failed at that is because I didn't allow myself to, to look weak, right? Um, so I always kind of pushed extra hard and extra hard and, and, and that hurt me in many ways uh, because we would say, let's say we would stay in studio and we would work for I don't know, I think my top times were at four days straight in the studio. Don't do that. Okay. Um, and then, you know, I felt proud that I was able to sustain that that strength, but, but then it, it messes with your mind, right? And not only your, your, your well-being and stuff like that, but, you know, after four days of not sleeping, you can have the most beautiful project in a paper, but when you go talk about it, silly you have no words you know it's it's something that I've actually learned from Kobe Bryant the basketball player you know this basketball player that I look at all the time like, he's like I get up and I work out two hours and then I go home and I eat and I work out two hours and this and that and I'm just getting good at my craft and my craft and then somebody I heard one interview with him one day and he's like man you know I work out so hard that the day that I had a game the most important game I was so exhausted that I was didn't perform. I had all the skills, I know, I knew all the moves, but when I had to go out there and show my, and, and play, I wasn't able to because I wasn't sleeping, because my mind wasn't clear. So just doing things, you know, to, to, to the extreme, it's, it's never a good thing. So no. that's less than what I brought with me today. Great, great, great advice. All right, so let's turn it over to our audience and yeah. Open the floor up for questions now that you know a little bit more about yeah, I know so Ellie and her journey. Yes. Hello. Um, has any of your projects ever been influenced by perhaps when they saw in Colombia? My projects by things that I saw in Colombia, yes. A lot of lots of stuff. But typically what I'm influenced by is by the conversations and the relationship you create with the client or the person that is looking for that project. Uh, but let's say as an example, I had a client that has a Colombian background and is, you know, typically uh, somebody would say, you know, this is, it reminds me of my childhood in Colombia and then I can connect with that and I, I, I'll tell them I know exactly what you want. And yeah, but I draw inspiration from everywhere. Okay, yeah. thank you. Yeah. Priscilla, thanks, Chris. Uh, what would be your advice to students um, trying to start their career in this what would be my, my first advice? Mm -hmm. Be okay with getting to know who you are and what works for you and forget about what the person next to you is doing. Honestly, that is the number one thing you need to learn. Like, what works for you and what do you like, right? Um, tons of us, you know, have this syndrome we call or some sort of syndrome of you know, looking at the person next to us, oh my God, they're so talented, oh my God, I'm never gonna be like that. You know, but you need to give yourself permission to, to say things like, that's awesome, and that's your talent. Uh, but, you know, I have my own, and four years or four, five years, it's a good time to learn. I mean, you're not gonna learn it all. Once you get to the real world, you're gonna keep exploring that. But getting to know what you really like and finding out why you're doing landscape architecture 
it's a great thing to do while you're going, while you're starting your career. Like, why is it that you're doing this? Because that's what's going to keep you driving to keep going when it gets hard. One. Yes. Uh, that's a part question. Yep. First, when did you realize you wanted to be a designer uh, at a younger age? And the second question is, what is your biggest failure in the industry? Oh, good one. Uh, first question, I, since I was a little, I grew up building little homes, like little shack houses, is that what you call them? In the trees? In trees. Colombia, when I was a little girl, I never played with dolls or did anything that's hurt. Uh, well, no, I don't mind. Uh, but anyway, I, I was always building things. My, my, like I said, my father was a forest engineer, right? So when we lived in Colombia, he made sure he bought a big piece of land and he just planted it all with like, pine trees and all these trees that he brought, seeds that he brought over from Brazil because he worked in the Amazon for, for many years there. Uh, so I was always building stuff. I, you know, I, I wanted to build little shacks for my friends to come over and have tea and building ramps to go on my bike, like very humble-ish, you know? So I always knew that I wanted to be an architect. At that time, I didn't want to be an architect. So it was something I was really born with. I always liked to do this design. Uh, failures. <coughs> my biggest failure as a professional? Yes, or in oh. general in design. Both, okay. <laughs> my biggest failure. <laughs> Oh, that's a really good question. Um, well, I, I kind of mentioned it a little bit before. I, I think that my biggest failure was as a student uh, not to be honest with myself and, and always trying to live up to somebody else's expectations and always trying to prove myself and prove myself and prove myself. And, you know, I think I lost a little bit of time figuring out who I was. Uh, because maybe I could have gotten there a little earlier and not wait 10 years. So, you know, just being a little more kind to myself, I think it would have saved me a lot of time, money, and effort. In my professional life, yes, I've made a lot of mistakes. Um, my biggest mistake mm, could probably be I think of one right now, because I have so many, you know, but that's, that's the only reason I have a lot. Um, you know, my biggest mistake is what that I would say I've done in my professional career is not uh, speak up when I when I wanted to be heard or, or when I knew I, I had to say something, uh, whether that was, uh, listen, I need a raise, or listen, I've been working non-stop for 90 hours, 80 hours, and I kind of need a break. I would just not say anything and just keep going and let people, you know, step all over me. It doesn't happen now, but mm -hmm. it did for a long time, and that's, that's you know, it's taking a, a, a toll on my health, um, and it's expensive, you know. Okay. Mm -hmm. Good questions. Yeah, good question. Are there... Yeah. No, I want you to know now. Your student that's about to graduate next month. What's the number one skill that you try to develop? The skills is something that you. It takes a little bit of time. What I would do if I'm about to graduate is grow my contact list exponentially. That's. It's all about relationships and who you know. Uh, the skills could. You could always get your skills. You know, all you need is a little patience and you know, uh, discipline and practice. Your contact list is it's one of the number one things that I wish I would have. So you always want to have options, you know. Uh, but it's sometimes it's a little bit too late when you're just about to graduate, and then all of a sudden you show up to every firm or every person that owns a business, and you're like, well, you know, I'm brand new. Here you go. Well, where were you, you know, all this time? How, you know, it's, it's a relationship you need to build. So. That would be my I, I would say too that the skills and building your network, these are things that are really very related, uh, almost two sides of the same coin, because recognizing what your limits are, recognizing the skills that others have, and knowing how that network can help complement you. You know, it's, it's, I think this idea that we have to know everything, you know, all the time, yeah. you know, is, is really 
flawed thinking, but the, the network and like you said, you know, yeah. making sure that you can pick up the phone and you know who is who has that knowledge, right? Structural engineer, the soil scientist, you know, yeah. whoever. I think these are. I think that's. Those yeah, are and great. I think that one of the things that you know, at least that we do in the foundation that I, I, I found, not that I found, but I've seen that is most helpful too is. You know, picking up the phone and talking to professionals and saying, you know, not an interview or anything like that. Just, hey, do you have, you know, uh, an afternoon that we can go have coffee and I'd like to show you the work that I did for school. Uh, that's a great way to get exposure because, you know, I might not be looking for somebody that, for somebody to work with me, but I know 10 people that are looking for us. So getting feedback on your on a, not, and not only your portfolio, you know, we, we put a lot of pressure on the portfolio, but just to have a conversation, hey, listen, I'm about to graduate, and I'm not sure whether I want to do uh, municipal work or whether I want to work for a private firm or whether, I, I'm, not, I'm not really sure, but maybe having a conversation with somebody that's out there doing the work can help you tons, you know, there's some things that you just don't find in Google, you know, you can't just Google like, what should I do, there's, you're going to read articles and stuff, but when you talk to people, they're most likely going to give you their honest feedback and tell you, you know, the good and the bad about whichever route you take. Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah. Other questions? Yeah. Anthony. What is the best strategy for branding yourself as a designer? Your reputation. So the reason why I'm able to sustain a business by myself now is because I have people that are calling me that met me 10 years ago and they said, I remember you because you worked so hard on my project and now I'm going to hire you. Um, <clears throat> and your reputation follows you everywhere. Your, your, your school reputation will follow you anywhere. And one of the things that I also wasn't aware when, when we went out into the real world is how small of a community we are. You're going to be working with or around or you're gonna to transfer to all, so if you don't like somebody in the studio or something, or you don't like somebody in the school, like chances are you are going to run into those people again. So it's very important that you guys know these things because you, know, you might end up working together uh, or you might end up asking that person if they're working somewhere they can help you get a job there and you and you know my boss does it to us all the time or my ex boss hey I got we have this portfolio from such and such and it looks like you guys went to school at the same time how is this person and I, there's been times where I would say I remember my I think it was my fifth or sixth year working you know the guy was a really cool guy but this guy always showed up late to class and always have an excuse for not having their work done. So I'm not going to say to my boss, hey, yeah, this person is great, you know, because they come into your office and then they're gonna be late and they're gonna have excuses for your clients, they're gonna cost you money and time. So you wanna make sure that your reputation is good. Honesty and hard working and, you know, doing landscape architecture with love. Mm -hmm. I have one more question. <laughs> <laughs> no, no worries. Um, so, if you're, as if you're a landscape architect and you said you want to be involved in architecture, but you also realize the design is home to those two things, have you been able to branch out of landscape architecture, explore like industrial design or product design, things like that? As this industry giving you that freedom or flexibility? It's, it's starting to now that I'm, like I said, I've dedicated the last three years to discipline myself so I have time for the things that I want. I mean, I always want to do, be working in landscape architecture. There's not one day, I mean, guys, I go to work one day and I, I hate life, you know, I don't want to deal with this climate. And this project is so boring or, you know, I can't wait to get out of here. Um, but what I learned through the years is that I do all the things I dislike. I'm not going to say hate, but I do all the things that I dislike first. I just get all those things out so I have enough time to do the things I know. So it's led, now I'm starting to have a little bit more freedom on the, uh, choosing the things I want to do. So have I thought about doing architecture and industrial design and that? No, but I love to talk to them. And if I have a project 
and I'm having a really difficult time understanding how to do a detail that is structural because I want to build this incredible landscape on the top roof and I have this really big idea. I call my friend Nicolas and I say, Nicolas, you're the best structural engineer that I know. You and I have a great relationship. You saw me cry all these years learning all this stuff. How do I make this happen? And then he's, he'll sit there and he'll teach me. He'll say, Listen, you want to do this? He says, the rebar that you need, and you need a wall that is this thick, and you need this, and don't forget about this. So, without even wanting to, I'm learning other other uh, disciplines. It's inevitable when you work in a le in a landscape architecture firm, you are going to work with architects, civil engineers, uh, structural engineers, mechanical, electrical, plumbing engineers. That that's your team right there. So you, you you don't have to know exactly what they do, but you need to understand the concepts, and you learn from them as well, as much as they also learn from you. They also call me, and they say, Elizabeth, look, my wife hates this tree in the back because it's like so messy, and we want to cut it down. And you know, I have to tell them, look, you got to cut it down. You got to get a permit. Be careful. Um, maybe you can plant something else. You know, there's these relationships that are inevitable, and they're awesome because you learn every single day. So. Uh, one or two more. Okay, so I'm going to ask you. <laughs> <laughs> so, do you, um, do you see, and just to expand on the next question, I yeah. have a question. Do you see landscape architecture um, when it comes to urban design start to integrate into industrial components, industrial design, mobility, things like that? Because right now, architecture is buildings, landscape, stack floors onto a plane. Where do you see design going in the landscape profession? Okay, you're going to have to break down that question a little bit for me. So, in Worsite, how is industrial design going to tie in with right. landscape architecture? Right, industrial design is really tied into infrastructure. Right? Yes. So, how do you see landscape architects grow in the future? Yeah. And, and technologies. Uh, how do you see it evolving? Yes, and you know what? That's a very good question. One of the reasons that I have a very important talk that I have with my team and with myself all the time. And if we go to the root of what we're doing with an example, our foundation, is because, you know, and I know that I'm like, have really big thinking sometimes, but we're running out of time as landscape writers. Overall, you know, there's really big issues out there. There's global warming, there's famine, there's all kinds of stuff, right? Landscape architecture needs to catch up really quickly. And there's so many things that we don't know about. And, and it's difficult because how do you do that, right? We ask landscape architects, as an example, oh, you know, you guys do all this sustainable design, you do all this, you, you make me spend millions of dollars in this design that you're doing for me that has a green roof and a water collector. Blah, blah, blah. And then I had a client ask me, like, what do you do? You're a landscape architect. What do you, how is your life sustainable? Mm -hmm. That's a tough one, right? So, um, and, and it's because I think that when we get out into the real world, like, you can't ask somebody that just graduated, oh, you know, how are you going to fix climate change? I'm sorry, I gotta pay my student bills. You know, that, you know why? You know why aren't you driving a Tesla? Oh, sorry, I'm just pay, You know, I just I don't even have a job. I'm not supposed to. So I think that to your back to your point is that uh, landscape architects we don't need to know everything about industrial design and structure, but we need to have an understanding because it is with them that we're gonna get to where we need to. Right? Uh, you won't believe the amount of times that I hear. Architects, um, arborists, uh, civil engineers, they make fun of landscape architects. Why? Because we only think about the pretty stuff. And, oh, that tree looks cool there. And, oh, you know, this is, you know, I want to build this amazing uh, reservoir or whatever it is. Like, something, think something crazy, crazy, right? Great idea. And then you put it next to, you give it to a, a, an engineer and they're like, did you even think about like how this would even work? Like, do, do you even know, you know, at least some of the systems so we can have a conversation? Have time, landscape architects says, no, you know, I mean, this is just my idea. Well, you know, there's, there's a problem with that. And it's very, it, it, it's a lot of pressure, right? I'm not about to go and learn 
civ I know some civil engineer and structural and architecture, I understand architecture, but the key is in the relationship you make, right? Like, look, I have this cool idea, how, how, would you, how would that work? And then they'll come back to you. They're like, look, we have this idea, but it's really ugly and the client does not like it because civil engineers are about numbers and lines and make it work, right? So it's that relationship that is gonna get us there. So you gotta understand that that's your real team out there. So we have a few more minutes left. So yeah. I, I put together some rapid fire questions. Oh, so <laughs> that, that hopefully, you, you can take as long as you want, but they're rapid fire. I'm not good at these. Minutes. Okay. All right, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna rapid Go. fire questions. So if COVID wasn't an issue, where would you like to travel next? <sighs> or budget, no COVID. Yeah, I have a place. It's in the Amazon and we were going. What's the name? It's where the last Amazonian tribes lives and it's in the border of Venezuela. That's where I would go, like that. Awesome. Like, mm -hmm. I want to see the last tribe. It's about to vanish. I'm, I'm right behind you. Tell me, once you remember the name. You <laughs> Favorite <laughs> meal. Favorite meal. Favorite meal? Yes. Uh, fondue. fondue. Mm -hmm. Cheese fondue. Cheese fondue. Okay. Yes. What's your favorite sound? I want to say the sound of silence, and it's only because I've had it once. <laughs> and it was when I went, uh, the thing that you jump on the plane. Um, Skydiving. 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 And I heard the sound of silence. It was the best part. I mean, I cried, I vomited, all that. <laughs> <laughs> the most incredible thing happens, and you learn what silence is. It's beautiful. It's amazing. Awesome. What's your favorite, favorite pastime? Non landscape related. Oh, I have a lot, but right now, uh, golf. Golf. <laughs> yes. I'm gonna learn it. It's expensive, by the way. <laughs> um, favorite artist or type of music? Can like, more than one. like song, like yeah. like singing. Mm -hmm. uh, music genre or um, artist. Well, right now, I mean, always and forever, uh, Frank Sinatra is, you know, an all-time favorite. Uh, Nat King Cole, I don't know if you guys know Nat King Cole. I'm all about the old stuff. I don't know anybody new. Don't my daughter knows everybody, but I don't know anything. I just hear like a lot of bad words. That's why you have that skill set in that network. No, That's you know. <laughs> yeah, I I'm super old school. Uh, I listen to. Um, right now, I'm into. Uh, white noise when I'm working and I listen to epic soundtracks, movie soundtracks all day long. <laughs> Natalie hates it, she's like this is terrible, but it feels good. Awesome. Alright, uh, last rapid fire. Uh, what are you reading or listening to now? Oh my god. Not music. But, you know. Yeah, I'm actually in between two books. I'm not crazy about it, but I'm reading uh, uh, The 48 Laws of Power. Mm -hmm. Green, really green. difficult to read. I'm like, I don't understand the laws of power. I don't want to have power, but it's it, it's interesting, you know. It's, you use a lot of, you know, it just teach. It's a guidebook um, to how, you know, how to how to create um, leadership and you know how to get what you want. And if you want somebody to do something, you do this. It's all over the place. And there, and then a book was recommended to me that is called The Potato Factor. Uh, Number one bestseller in Australia. Everybody talks about it, so I started reading it uh, just because I want to learn a little bit of the history of Australia uh, back then in the 1800s, uh, 1900s, back then. Um, so yeah, those are the two things I'm reading. I'm not completely in love with it. The last book that I read about a month ago that really got to me was Tuesdays with Maury. Oh yeah. Cry. You know, it makes you think about life. So. Awesome. So I mean, it sounds like Australia is on your mind. I want, know, I don't know why I'm going to say that. And if I can be so bold as to recommend a book that is more or less, I guess, okay. dealing with some of the time, but um, The Song Lines by Bruce Chatwin. It's okay. very landscape related. I read this book decades ago before I had any idea what landscape was. And what I loved about it is that in the tradition of the Aboriginal Indians in Australia, uh, the, the native people and the songs are painting pictures of the landscape so that they know where to go and what to navigate. So they'll sing about where the water is, where the large mountain is, 
where they can find, you know, food, etc. Oh, cool. And these stories, these songs, mm -hmm. are basically giving them a map and uh, a, a, an oral history. Map, sure. Um, which I always find to be so powerful in terms of architecture because it's that uh, that connection between memory mm -hmm. and culture and landscape. Uh, and this book is all about that. They're the song lines, so the songs trace the line in the landscape. Very cool. Check I'm going to write that down. Yeah. Um, awesome. Wait till I finish reading the, the, the Potato Factory because it's, it's like 25 hours long on the audio book, but I'll put, like it on it, my, yeah. I'll put it on my wish list. Great. Well, Ellie, thank you so much. I think, you know, no, well, you know in everything that you've talked about, um, I didn't write these down, so I might miss some, but I think being honest with yourself yeah. I think it's a theme that um, runs across many of the things that we talked about. The appetite for learning, knowing what you don't know. Um, I really appreciate that. I, I think, I mean, thinking of you as a student, thinking of you now, um, that appetite to absorb and learn, I think that's something, that's the best shield and you know, I think that you yeah. exemplify that. Um, and lastly, the long haul. It's like, this pressure to get things done right now, yeah. immediately, is almost like a false narrative. And oh, taking yeah. your time, getting Take better. Your time. Don't yeah. try to be best, be better. I think that's something. Yeah, that. absolutely. Like, really take your time because it's more rewarding at the end. You know, like, once you, in your body will tell you when, when you're there, you know. And, and the process, you know, you might fall, you might have the worst time, but, you know, you either fail or, or lose or something, but there's always learning opportunities on everything. So, you know, I know that we're all, we live in the, yeah, the, the hack, is that what they call it? Oh, what's the hack to get this? What's, you know, I see people going on YouTube videos, like, how to design the landscape faster, product right? no, something like that. And, you know, it just, it's not about that. You can't, you can learn these things. You have to give yourself permission to try and try and fail and try and know what works for you and what doesn't, it, it doesn't. And if you learn that now, you're most likely going to land in a team that reflects that, those values. Yeah. And that is the goal. Awesome. Well, let's have a big Thank round you. of applause for everyone. Thank Thanks you guys everybody. for coming Sorry, out. Sorry, you have to stay late. I know. No, it's eight o'clock. I'm going to take your party to me. Put it in the company credit card. Right. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Come back on Thursday.